if one day, I'm, I'm pretty sure one day, there will be a robotics company. By robotics company, I mean the primary source of income is, is from robots that is worth over $1 trillion. What do you think that company will do? I think self-driving cars, no? It's interesting because my mind went to personal robotics, robots in the home. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's much more market opportunity there. I think it's very difficult to achieve. I mean, this this <laughs> this might speak to something important, which is I understand self-driving much better than I understand robotics in the home. So I understand how difficult it is to actually solve self-driving to a, to a level, not just the actual computer vision and the control problem and just the, the basic problem of self-driving, but creating a product that would undeniably be, um, that would cost less money, like it would save you a lot of money, like orders of magnitude less money that could replace Uber drivers, for example. So car sharing that's autonomous, that creates a similar or better experience in terms of how quickly you get from A to B or just whatever, the, the pleasantness of the experience the efficiency of the experience, the value of the experience, and at the same time, the car itself costs cheaper. I, d I think that's very difficult to achieve. I, I think there's a, a lot more um, low-hanging fruit in the home. That, that that could be. I also want to give you a perspective on like how challenging it would be at home or like it maybe kind of depends on the exact problem that you'd be solving. Like uh, if we're speaking about these robotic arms, and hence, these things, they cost tens of thousands of dollars or maybe 100K. And, uh, you know, maybe obviously, maybe if there would be economy of scale, these things would be cheaper. But actually for any household to buy it, the price would have to go down to maybe thousand bucks. Yeah. I personally think that, uh, so self-driving car, it provides a clear service. I don't think robots in the home there'll be a trillion dollar company will just be all about service. Meaning it, it will not necessarily be about like a robotic arm that's helps you, I don't know, open a bottle <laughs> or wash the dishes or uh, any of that kind of stuff. It has to be able to take care of that whole, the, the therapist thing you mentioned. I, I think that's, um, of course, there's a line between what is a robot and what is not. Like does it really need a body, but you know, so, someone, uh, AI system with some embodiment, I think. So the tricky part when you think actually what's the difficult part is um, when the robot has, uh, like when there is a diversity of the environment with which the robot has to interact, that becomes hard. So, you know, on one spectrum, you have uh, industrial robots as they are doing over and over the same thing. It is possible to some extent to prescribe the movements and with very small amount of intelligence, the the movement can be repeated millions of times. Mm -hmm. um, the it, it, there are also you know various pieces of industrial robots where it becomes harder and harder. Like uh, for instance, in case of Tesla, it might be a matter of putting a, a rug inside of a car, mm -hmm. and you know because the rug kind of moves around, it's uh, it's not that easy. It's not exactly the same every time. It ends up being the case that you need actually humans to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, while, you know, welding cars together, it's a very repetitive process. Mm -hmm. um, then in case of self-driving itself, uh, the difficulty has to do with the diversity of the environment, but still the car itself, um, the problem that you are solving is you try to avoid even interacting with things. You are not touching anything around because touching itself is hard. And then if you would have in the home, uh, robot that, you know, has to touch things. And like, if these things, they change the shape, if there is a huge variety of things to be touched, mm -hmm. then that's difficult. If you are speaking about the robot, which there is, you know, head that is smiling in some way with cameras that yeah. it doesn't, you know, touch things, that's relatively simple. Okay. So to both agree and to push back. So you're referring to touch, like soft robotics, like the actual touch, but I would argue that you could formulate just basic interaction between um, like non-contact interaction is also a kind of touch. Yeah. And that might be very difficult to solve. That's the basic, dis not disagreement, but that's the basic open question to me with self-driving cars and disagreement with Elon. 
which is how much interaction is required to solve self-driving cars, how much touch is required. You said that in your intuition, touch is not required. In my intuition to create a product that's compelling to use, you're going to have to uh, interact with pedestrians, not just avoid pedestrians, but interact with them. When we drive around in major cities, we're constantly threatening everybody's life with our movements. Um, and that's how they respect us. There's a game theory going on with pedestrians. And I'm afraid you can't just formulate autonomous driving as a, a collision avoidance problem. So I, I think it goes beyond, like a collision avoidance is the first order approximation. Uh, but then at least in case of Tesla, they are gathering data from people driving their cars. And I believe that's an example of supervised learning data that mm -hmm. they can train their models uh, on and they are doing it, uh, which you know can give a model this like uh, another level of uh, uh, of a uh, behavior that is needed to actually interact with the real world. Yeah, it's interesting how much data is required to achieve that. Um, what, what do you think of the whole Tesla autopilot approach, the computer vision based approach with multiple cameras and as a data engine, it's a multitask, multi headed neural network, and is this fascinating process of uh, similar to what you're talking about with the, the robotics approach, uh, which is, you know, you deploy a neural network and then there's humans that use it and then it runs into trouble in a bunch of places and that stuff is sent back. So like the deployment discovers a bunch of edge cases and those edge cases are sent back for supervised annotation, thereby improving the neural network and that's deployed again it goes over and over until the, the network becomes really good at uh, the task of driving, becomes safer and safer. What do you think of that kind of approach to robotics? I believe that's the way to go. So in some sense, even when I was speaking about, you know, collecting trajectories from humans, that's like a first step. And then you deploy the system and then you have humans revising the, all the issues. And in some sense, like this approach converges to system that doesn't make mistakes because for the cases where there are mistakes, you gather data, how to fix them and the system will keep on improving. So there's a very, to me, difficult question of how hard that, you know, how long that converging takes, how hard it is. Uh, the other aspect of autonomous vehicles, this probably applies to certain robotics applications is society, right? They put, as, as the quality of the system converges, so one, there's a human factors perspective of psychology of humans being able to supervise those, uh, even with teleoperation, those robots. And the other is society willing to accept robots. Currently society is much harsher on self-driving cars than it is on human driven cars in terms of the expectation of safety. So the bar is set much higher than for humans. And we're, so if there's a death in, a, in an autonomous vehicle that's seen as a much more, um, much more dramatic than a death in a human driven vehicle. Part of the success of deployment of robots is figuring out how to make robots part of society, both on the just the human side, on the media journalist side, and also on the policy government side. And that seems to be, uh, maybe you can put that into the objective function to optimize. But th that is that is definitely um, a tricky one. And I wonder if that is the, actually the trickiest part for self-driving cars or any system that's safety critical. It's not the algorithm, it's the society accepting it. Yeah, I, I, I would say, I believe that the part of the process of deployment is actually showing people that the given things can be trusted. Yeah. And, uh, you know, trust is also like a glass that is actually really easy to crack it. Yeah and uh, damage it. And uh, I think that's actually very common with uh, uh, with innovation, that there is some resistance toward it. Yeah. And uh, it's just a natural progression. So in some sense, people will have to keep on proving that indeed these systems are worth being used. And I would say, I also found out that often the best way to convince people is by letting them experience it. Yeah, absolutely. That's the case with Tesla Autopilot, for example. That's the case with, uh, yeah, with basically robots in general. It's it's kind of funny to hear people talk about robots. Like there's a lot of fear, even with like legged robots. 
But when they actually interact with them, there's joy. I love interacting with them. And the same with the car. With, with, with a robot, if it starts being useful, I think people immediately understand. And if the product is designed well, they fall in love. You're right. It's actually even similar when I'm thinking about Copilot, the GitHub Copilot. There was a spectrum of responses that people had. And uh, ultimately, uh, the important piece was to let people try it out. Mm-hmm. And then many people just uh, loved it. Especially like programmers. Yeah, programmers. But like uh, some of them, you know, they came with a fear. Yeah. But then you try it out and you think, actually, that's cool. Like, uh, And, you know, you can try to resist the same way as, you know, you could resist moving from punch cards to, let's say, uh, C++ or so. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit futile. 